well, I might be a little bit odd within the tinnitus field because I'm a neurosurgeon, so my specialty is to try and treat tinnitus through brain surgery or non-invasive neuromodulation in general. Initially, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, when the tinnitus field really took off, we thought tinnitus was very easy. It was an overactivity of the auditory cortex. And then we thought, well, we can cure everybody by putting an electrode on top of the hyperactive zone in the auditory cortex. Unfortunately, that failed um, because we could only treat about one third of the patient with normal brain stimulation and then we could rescue another one-third by changing the stimulation design. So basically the way in which we communicated with the brain, but then we realized it was not the solution. And then we initially came up with uh, the idea that it's actually not just one area in the brain that's overactive, but that it's a whole network. And so we had to adjust our um, treatments based on that. And now we actually think it's more of a problem of a balance between too much overactivity and um, where sound is processed in the brain and not enough noise suppressing activity so that it's a kind of a balance and that this balance is actually controlled by what you could call the reward system in your brain. So what we're currently doing in our research is trying to modify this reward system by presenting sounds that are different from the tinnitus and giving those sounds a reward by implanting electrodes uh, currently in animals, but of course in the future we want to do that in humans, and rewarding those non tinnitus sounds. In the second approach, we will do the opposite. We will put an electrode in another part of the brain, which is the, this reward part of the brain called the habenula, and we will pair that with the tinnitus sound. So basically it's reconditioning the brain to uh, not give importance to the tinnitus sound, and a way to try and get rid of the loudness, not just the distress. The way you can stimulate the brain um, can be done in two ways, basically. One way is non-invasive, where you apply magnetic stimuli or electrical stimuli to different parts of the brain tinnitus network, so not just only the auditory cortex, but also the frontal cortex, the anterior signal, etc. So to Put it relatively simple, there is three important pathways that are involved in tinnitus. One, which is that brings sound to the brain, with the other pathway that gives emotional significance to the sound. Basically, that's the pathway that tells you that you suffer because of the tinnitus. And then there is a third pathway which suppresses sound. So either you try and decrease the influence of the sound processing pathway or the emotional pathway or you activate the pathway that suppresses the sound. So you can do that uh, in an isolated way, or you can try and combine that. So one of the uh, ways we want to try it now is to modulate all three of those pathways at the same time. And there has been um, a very recently a new tool developed, which is a 32-channel electrical stimulator that can do different stimulation designs at different parts of the brain so that we can inhibit the uh, sound pathway and the emotional pathway, but that we can activate the uh, inhibitory pathway. So basically, part of the research depends on the development of technology. And uh, even though you might have a good idea, sometimes technologically it's not possible. But with the current rapid evolution of technology, luckily we have a lot more tools now than we had a couple of years ago. The non-invasive stimulation, whether that is with magnetic or electrical stimuli, applies those magnetic or electrical stimuli from the outside. So uh, part of the current, for example, in electrical stimulation goes through the skin and that's it. It just uh, goes from one side, for example, to the other side. But uh, about 50% goes not just through the skin, but also through the brain. And so you can target where you want to um, direct the current by using what is called high definition uh, stimulation and that is stimulation with a lot of different electrodes. So to put it into very simple terms, you get a cap on your head, which has, which is very similar to the cap that is used to record brain activity. Um, and you can record brain activity through this cap, but those electrodes that are in the cap are also capable of sending current then, which goes partly through the skin and partly um, to the brain. That's the electrical stimulation, and that can come in different forms. So you can have 
direct current, which is similar to a car battery, basically, with one anode and one cathode, and the current goes from anode to cathode, just like in a car. And then you can also have alternating current, which is the same current that you use to, um, to turn on light, etc. The, the current that we use at home. And then you also have random noise, which comes in different forms, and the random noise is very chaotic. And the beauty of random noise is that your brain cannot adjust to that kind of stimulation. Um, because it is so chaotic. That comes in different kinds. You can have pink noise, brown noise, it doesn't really matter, but the essence is that it is an unpredictable kind of stimulation so that the brain cannot adjust to that stimulation. Magnetic stimuli are similar, but uh, the beauty of that magnetic stimuli is that the skull does not block magnetic stimuli. It does block electrical stimuli, but not magnetic. And so uh, the disadvantage of that is this, a big expensive tool and you can feel it in, in contrast to the electrical stimuli. And even though it might seem more focalized, the problem is you cannot, you, you cannot stimulate easily at multiple different places at the same time with magnetic stimuli. So my prediction is that in the future, magnetic stimuli will actually be replaced by high definition and electrical stimuli because it is more variable. Uh, people can even do it at home um, in contrast to magnetic stimuli. And it's a lot more versatile.